Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator from Gibson's Bookstore, and I am joined this evening by author Tony Hiss, who is the author of Rescuing the Planet, Protecting Half the Land to Heal the Earth, a book about wilderness conservation to save our planet and ourselves. This book is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We are open for in-store browsing, curbside pickup, and we are very happy to ship books to you. We have a website. We take orders over the phone and again as i mentioned in store browsing uh tony this book is about um wilderness conservation we are very pleased to have you here joining us tonight to discuss this topic please tell me a bit about your book well first i've got to say it's a great pleasure to be with you even virtually in the beautiful and historic landscape uh, and in a great indie bookstore that is itself part of the historic fabric and legacy of the Granite State. Gibson's is now 123 years old, a perfect place to talk about protecting half of all land and water to save, stave off a mass extinction crisis. That's what we're faced with. So it's about half earth to keep life alive. I think that's an and, excellent analogy. Please tell us some more. Well, perhaps I could start by showing you a few pictures. Sounds great. Wonderful. Such a pleasure to be here. Now, how do I, ah, here we are. Beyond climate change, the world faces a grave calamity. A million species are at imminent risk of extinction and some are already gone. This is Sudan, the last male Northern white rhino who died in Kenya in 2018. We've already had to come up with a word we shouldn't have to need, endling. An endling is the last of its kind. This is Lonesome George, the last known Pinta Island tortoise in the Galapagos Islands, who died in 2012 at the age of 101. For a long time, we thought rather single-mindedly about what we needed to do to make America the place we wanted to live in. This is a painting from 1872 called American Progress, Progress being that golden haired young lady, not wearing very many clothes, was trailing behind her telegraph wires as she moves inexorably from the East Coast to the West Coast, accompanied by a stagecoach, a covered wagon, and several trains. And retreating before her are Native Americans, bison, and a snarling bear as farmers replace the forest. It's not that anything we were doing then was wrong in itself, it's that we seem to think it was always a question of either or. Either we did something completely new or we had to just accept that things were the way they had always been before we got here. The good news is that some people began thinking rather differently. At, at about almost the same time. This is a picture of a man named Benton Mackay, who as a young forester, just graduating from college in the summer of 1900, bushwhacked his way up Stratton Mountain in Vermont, climbed to the top of the tallest tree he could find, and swaying there, he seemed to have a vision in his mind, what he called a planetary feeling. He could see in his mind the entire Appalachian mountain range from Maine to Georgia, crossing 14 states as a single place, a place of wildness. And in addition to a mountain on the peaks of the hills, and he began to think about a trail running along the peaks of those hills, there was the landscape on either side, a large area he called a wild realm. Well, that vision came into being the Appalachian Trail uh, runs 2,190 miles from Maine to Georgia through 14 states. 
and it was, has been almost entirely constructed and entirely maintained by volunteers. But that Appalachian realm that uh, Mackay was able to see in his mind is only the smallest of the four large landscapes that define North America. On the right of your screen, you can see the Appalachian realm. It's that band running from top to bottom from north to south. It's paralleled by the Rocky Mountains to the west. Uh, America is lucky at having this geography that shows us the state of where we are and what we are. So neatly with these two bracketing mountain ranges. Another visionary in the 1990s, a Canadian activist and lawyer named Harvey Locke saw all the expanse between Yellowstone National Park up to the Yukon as a single landscape. And that started a conservation movement called Yellowstone to Yukon or Y2Y, which is now protected something like 21% of that enormous landscape. And others have said it itself is only a part of something even bigger, a mountain chain running from Mexico all the way up to Alaska. And then even bigger is this enormous landscape across the top of the continent, the boreal forest uh, in Canada and Alaska. It's 3,700 miles long. It's 1,000 miles from top to bottom. It is the most intact and largest wild place left on planet Earth. Less cut over than the Amazon rainforest, less cut over than the forests in Siberia. An extraordinary treasure, and it's at least 85% intact. And now there's a new, a whole new idea of how to protect it more speedily, and that's by working with the Native Americans up there, the indigenous peoples of Canada, the First Nations, as they call themselves, the people who've been looking after that land and understanding it for 10,000 years. They're setting up what are called indigenous protected areas, which are a new kind of national park in which the indigenous people themselves will be the park rangers, mucklucks on the ground. Then at the bottom of the continent is the most recently recognized landscape, the North American coastal plain biodiversity hotspot. This beautiful map, by the way, is one I had commissioned for the book and it appears as the end papers of the book. It really makes a difference. Now it's a good thing we began thinking at these large scales because even as far back as 1988, it was becoming apparent that our original idea of just setting up national parks uh, for animals um, wasn't working out very well because the animals didn't realize that the parks, they were supposed to stop at the park edge and uh, they needed to wander around. So the landscapes were never quite large enough. And at the same time, they were getting hemmed in by development. Something had to give and, and yet it's taken us from the time Yellowstone was set up in 1870 until now to protect about 15% of the planet. However, science is telling us we need to protect far more than that and far more quickly. That's the great challenge. Half Earth, as it's called. And people, the question I get asked most frequently is why half Earth? Well, several reasons. One is scientific studies have showed that unless an animal has access to at least half of its original habitat, it begins to dwindle away. However, and as I said, we've only protected about 15% so far, but bump that up to 50% and we have a chance of saving up to 85 to 90% of all the animals and plants. This is a piece of half earth predictive math that Edward O. Wilson, the great Harvard biologist has managed to contribute to the picture by pointing out that there is a, a, a natural ratio between the size of a place and how many things can live in it. Please take a moment to look deep into the eyes of this fierce looking Russian scientist, Vladimir Yovanovitch Vernadsky. In the 1920s, Vernadsky began think, thinking bigger than anyone when he wrote a book called Biosfera, the first 
book to really come to grips with the size and shape and purpose of the biosphere, that layer of life surrounding the earth that contains everything living, us and every other species that ever was or ever will be. Vernadsky managed to point out that there are three basic dimensions to the biosphere. It's incredibly old. We now know it to be 3.8 billion years or older. It's uh, incredibly immense, seen from side to side, the wonders of the world, but it has a third dimension, its height or its lack of height. It's incredibly thin. Almost all of life is contained within a layer from the bottom of the ocean to the top of Mount Everest. That's 12 and a half miles, which means that if it were laid out on the ground as a horizontal distance, you could drive it in less than 20 minutes. The next time you're driving around, take a moment to think, 12 and a half miles from here, I will have reached the other end of life. One end of life to the other, 12 and a half miles, 20 minutes. This is the constraint placed on every living creature, us and everything else too. Um, here we are in this place that's immensely aged, uh, immensely, immensely rich and resilient with life, but also by its very nature, precarious. We've been finding all kinds of wonderful new things as we keep exploring around uh, the biosphere. For instance, this spider that was discovered in India just a few years ago, it now has the scientific name of Aerovixia griffindori deliberately because they thought it looked exactly like the sorting hat in Harry Potter. And the Indian scientists thought, it's time people realize insects can be cute and adorable. So we have to recognize that. And on the right is a vulture that can fly so high in Africa, one of them once collided with a jet, jet plane in flight. So within this uh, conveyance, this sphere that we live in, the biosphere, uh, there are these constraints. If we're going to try to achieve half Earth, we have our own three R's and we can go back to the half earth blackboard for a moment. We have to retain everything that is now wild. We have to restore things that were once wilder and we have to reconnect places that got disconnected to each other as we uh, thought of, failed to think about keeping them connected. Here in New England, um, it's often said that the six states constitute a second chance landscape. Um, in, it was an area that was 90% forested when the pilgrims got here. Then in the early 19th century, it was an area that became 80% deforested, unforested, because of a sheep craze that uh, swept the region. Um, farmers chopped down the woods in order to create fields that were giant sheep pens. The sheep craze went bust in the 1840s. Um, the forests returned by themselves. The area is now collectively 80% forested once again. And a group called the Wildlands and Woodlands Vision uh, has pointed out that New England can retain 70% permanent land cover in forest if it so, so chooses by upping the rate of conservation. And local land trusts are banding together into what are called regional conservation partnerships to make that possible. This large forest on the right is actually um, near the Quabbin Reservoir in Massachusetts. Here in, uh, here in Concord, very interesting juxtaposition. That wilderness, that is generated by the Quabbin Reservoir, the so-called accidental wilderness, because the Quabbin Reservoir drowned towns in Massachusetts so to provide a reservoir of drinking water for Boston in the 1930s. But stretching north from there is a wild landscape reaching up through New Hampshire up to Cardigan Mountain and the White Mountains. So you have, on the one hand, wilderness pushing east into the Merrimack Valley, and in the 
Merrimack Valley itself, seen here, here in Haverhill, uh, you have uh, urban growth and suburban growth pushing north uh, from Boston. So it's this bi-state landscape. And in the middle of it, you have this great victory, the uh, Carner Blue Butterfly, the official insect of New Hampshire, but eight years after it was officially declared the state insect, it looked as though there were no more Carner Blue Butterflies in the state. So just east, well, really just a mile or two east of the of Gibson's uh, out near the airport is this Pine Barrens area um, where the Carner Blue has been reintroduced uh, very successfully and it now turns out it's uh, an area that protects and, and is uh, home to 278 kinds of butterflies and moths. Uh, right in the middle uh, of what is otherwise an unprepossessing prepossessing looking area with the airport, uh, a post office facility, various other things bumping up against it. Pine Barrens, interesting name. It was called that Barrens because it wasn't very good soil for growing things in, as if it had no other use. Just like back in that picture of American progress, at that point, we were only thinking of one thing at a time. Could we grow something on it or couldn't we? Among birders, there's a wonderful phrase, spark bird. It's that bird that they first caught sight of at one point in their life that uh, then wouldn't let go of them. Thereafter became part of their everyday life that they felt a deep connection to nature through that bird. But you know, it doesn't have to be a bird. It could be uh, a wildflower. It could be a butterfly like the Carner Blue. It could be a favorite view. It could be swinging from a treetop like Benton Mackay and suddenly seeing an immense landscape as a single place. It's a great pleasure to be here with Elizabeth tonight. Uh, thank you, and I want to uh, point out that we can't have a regular book signing these days at the moment, but I do have an alternative to offer to you. Uh, Knopf will be delighted to send out uh, signed book plates, and anyone who tells Elizabeth that they would like an individually inscribed signed book plate, all she has to do is send me your name and I will send her an individual, individually inscribed and signed book place. Uh, thanks very much, Elizabeth. I think we can get back to uh, talking to each other. Wonderful. Let me just figure out my own camera here. All right, we and we're back. That was a great presentation. Um, I really loved uh, the mention there of the Carner Blue butterfly, which I do remember people being very excited when I was younger that it was coming back and how nervous they were about the butterflies going away. So it's, it's nice to see that this is actually one of the questions I have of, have we seen any success stories? Are there any species that are rebounding from conservation efforts? Um, so I guess, I guess we could start off with, with that. Um, or maybe we could save that for the end. I guess where we should start is, uh, so, the conservation, let's let's start with a basic question for people who are new to talking about conservation, which is the slightly rough question of why should humans care? Now, I know why we should care um, because we live here and I, I would like my home to stay nice. So what are some of the impacts of not taking care of our environment, what are some of the impacts on humans? Um, perhaps uh, the, the cleanliness of the air or the water or the impacts of biodiversity on crops. Why, why should the average person care? Well, I'm afraid it's because we don't have much choice. Uh, unless we're taking care of the place in a way that benefits us and the rest of life, um, life begins to get much much more difficult uh, and very quickly. There are really two intertwined crises. And one is the climate crisis, which is talking about mostly about the setting, the air and the water. Um, but there's also 
the life itself and what life itself does to sustain life. For instance, that uh, boreal forest that I mentioned up in Canada, that extraordinarily immense and breathtaking landscape. It has two nicknames. It's called North American Bird Nursery because billions, literally billions of songbirds and shorebirds fly up there every spring to raise the next generation. But it's also called the Fort Knox of Carbon because if those trees were chopped down, the carbon in those trees and the carbon in the soil that's growing them and the peatlands around them, if that was all to be released at once into the air, that would be the equivalent of 37 years worth of fossil fuel emissions from every other source. So it would put us into terrible trouble. So uh, they're working on our behalf and I think they're beginning to ask us to be, work on their behalf saying that everyone benefits if this is what happens. And what so excited me about writing this book was finding out how many people all over the continent are taking up this cause either locally and uh, New Hampshire is actually a very lucky place because you have a wealth, a network of local land trusts, people working on areas as small as the few acres that contain the Carner Blue and people working on much, much larger landscapes like the whole Merrimack Valley or like the Quabbin to Cardigan uh, range uh, to the west. Uh, and so it, it's a, anyone who gets interested, it's almost impossible not to find a way to take a part in this. Uh, just Google local land trusts. Because of course, that's another message is that we're no matter where we are, even here, and I'm speaking to you from Manhattan, uh, we're always within an ecosystem. And it was pointed out to me, even the sidewalk out in front of my building, the little cracks in the sidewalk have tiny little uh, plants that no one can get rid of, ruderal vegetation it's called, and the sidewalks themselves have huge families of ants that are fighting each other for territorial possession. It's, there's something going on wherever we are. Uh, and of course, people up in the Concord area are lucky to have lots and lots of opportunities to look around and see beautiful places, some of which are protected, some of which are calling out for protection. Uh, it, it's hard not to think uh, of how, I mean, I mean, I wish I were with you in person and not virtually with you because it's such an extraordinary place to be in. We're, we are indeed very, very lucky here. I, I like to joke that when I come from another state and cross um, whenever we drive somewhere and then we cross back into the state, I swear I can smell the difference in the air quality because ah. New Hampshire is so clean and green. Um, and we are, as you mentioned, very invested in land conservation. I believe that there is a state license plate you can get a special plate where you pay an extra fee to get a, a plate. We call it the moose plate. It has a moose on it and then ah. a couple uh, of your numbers and letters. And that fee goes into a land conservation trust run by the state, which we're very lucky to have it right there. You can just opt in. You give like your, it's, it's not inexpensive. I think it's I don't remember the last time I saw it. it's somewhere from 75 to 100 dollars but per person but it's it's nice to have that going into a conservation trust because I like having clean air to breathe uh, to our audience members at home if you have a question or a conversation topic about conver conservation that you would like us to touch on um, please feel free to free to put those in the chat. Tony, you mentioned another, you're hitting all these questions that I had written down already. Uh, and one of them was, can we conserve inside cities? I know that some cities, I mean, we, we have these grand ideas of wide open swaths of prairie and forest, but there are also cities that are installing sort of bridges for wildlife so that they can cross over highways or small parks within or like the Carner Blue, they, they set aside a small area. It is within city limits, but it is a conservation area. Can we make an impact by conserving small packs within cities? Yes, a huge impact. Um, 
on the one hand, um, the park systems of the 50 largest uh, urban areas in, in the country um, joined together to look at themselves. And it turns out that something like 80% of the land that's officially parkland in these cities is in some kind of wild shape still. In fact, if you amalgamated all that land, it would be three quarters the size of Yellowstone National Park. Um, and another fact that I only just came across um, was that it's possible to take any lawn, a suburban lawn, and uh, reconfigure it so it's wildlife friendly, attracting birds and butterflies. And one estimate was that if people devoted even half of their lawns all across the country to these biodiversity friendly uh, pursuits, that would free up something like 20 million acres for biodiversity pursuits, which it would be something like 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park. So the, the opportunities are just everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Um, and you'd mentioned bridges. Um, that's something that was pioneered again up in Canada. Banff National Park, which is almost as old as Yellowstone, a wonderful national park, uh, is traversed by a transcontinental highway. Uh, and on that highway in the summertime, there's a vehicle passing every three seconds, which makes it almost impossible for large animals to cross. Um, and in fact, here in the States, something like a one to two million large animals get killed on highways every year. Well, they've come up with a wonderful remedy for that in Banff. They've built 43 bridges and, and tunnels over and under the highway only for animals. Uh, no humans allowed, please. And as a result, because they have cameras tracking this, um, something like in the last 20 years, 200,000 animals have made successful crossings who might otherwise have been killed. And that means grizzly bears, it means mountain lions, it means moose, it means all everything, little and big. Uh, because as I say, they're, they're tracked by cameras, but they also can see their footprints in the dirt uh, as, they, as they move past. So again, this is beginning to think beyond thinking at one thing at a time. Yes, the highways brought the country together in a wonderful way, but they also acted like enormous sheep pens, um, keeping animals apart. The great stone walls of New England are, are really the remnants of that sheep craze. Uh, all those fields, those walls were there to keep the sheep in. Uh, well, now the highways weren't built as sheep pens, but they keep animals from moving around the way they would uh, if they had their druthers. Um, that's another th wonderful thing I discovered is that we now we're able to let the animals tell us their story too, as we've gotten better and better at tracking their whereabouts. Um, and one of the pioneering animals uh, was a wolf named Pluey because she was caught in a rainstorm. So they gave her the name Pluey. Uh, fitted with a collar in the early 90s, one of the first collars that could be read off of a satellite, its signal. Um, they thought, well, Pluey might move around a bit. We know wolves move around a bit, maybe 50, 60 miles. And then Pluey disappeared. They were stopped getting signals and they thought, oh, well, you know, this happens. Uh, something went wrong. And several months later, a NASA engineer said, we've just picked up a signal from your, your wolf. And it turned out Pluey uh, was traversing two Canadian provinces, three US states, covering an area itself 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park. And suddenly we knew that wolves are capable of wandering over immense distances. And so if we're gonna think about being uh, friendly to, or at least being uh, tolerant of wolves, we have to think in totally different kinds of terms uh, than we were used to. So Bluey is sort of the co-founder of that Yellowstone to Yukon uh, initiative that's doing so well. Yeah. And uh, it's suddenly becoming a hot topic because uh, 
50 by 50 is the half earth phrase, the goal, um, protecting half the land by say 2050 as a way of staving off extinction of a million species. And even 10 years ago, when I started to work on this book, that sounded a little improbable and a little over ambitious. Uh, and in fact, when I made uh, the acquaintance of the great Harvard biologist, Edward O. Wilson, who's been such a champion of biodiversity going back to the 1980s, he said, well, you gotta get people to set their sights high. This is what in the business world is called a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. It's the kind of thing that President Kennedy challenged us with at the beginning of the 60s. Put a man on the moon in, the, in this decade. And sometimes that galvanizes people in a way that they never would have expected. And we did put someone on the moon uh, within 10 years. But now this issue is sort of, of the protection of animals and plants has caught up with us in a way that I wouldn't have expected would happen so rapidly. And just uh, two months ago, the Biden administration has adopted as at least an interim goal, 30 by 30 protecting 30% 30 of the US by the year 2030. Um, 56 other nations have now signed on to that idea. And in October, 196 nations are gonna meet in China for a week and are expected to adopt that as a global goal, 30 by 30. So suddenly uh, we sort of need to know about how, why, how, what's happening. And as I said, the, the most encouraging news is that so much is happening um, and in so many different places and at so many different scales and with so many different strategies that we actually have a good shot at pulling this off and at protecting, protecting the rest of life along with making our own circumstances healthier. Uh, so that touched on a whole lot of different, and I have a whole lot of other questions that I now want to ask. I, I have, there's a, I'm fascinated by uh, how successful the land bridges are for migration. And there's a joke in New Hampshire. Um, we have signs, road signs that say moose crossing and deer crossing um, for, to alert motorists that this is a frequent area where moose and deer are crossing. And the joke is, well, how does the deer know to cross there? Like it's a crosswalk. Um, and so, oh, and of course the sign is put there because the deer is crossing there, whether or not there's a sign there. So the land bridges are successful. Do we find that the wildlife are teaching their, their young to seek out the bridge? now or is it just how is how how does that work it's not like there's a tutorial like dear dear please cross here but well uh there's two answers to that it's a good very good question one is we do guide them Th those bridges and tunnels up in banff national park um th they do have discrete fencing along the edges of the highways so that they're stopped from crossing anywhere and funneled towards these culverts and bridges. But you're right, some animals just plow across right away. Others hold back and wait to see what's gonna happen. And it does, and sometimes it does take the next generation. It's a very interesting new idea about what it means to be a wild critter. Uh, Yes, you're born wild, but you sort of have to learn to be wild and you learn it from your parents. And if your parents know to make a certain crossing, you will make that crossing and you'll tell your kids to make that crossing. But if, the, if those crossings get severed, it can often take several generations before they get rediscovered, before the most adventuresome and nosiest uh, of the critters say, well, let's try it go this way. So, it's a learning experience. And, and we're realizing that animals have their own culture. And part of that is, where do I need to be and where, how do I get there? Uh, it doesn't just happen automatically. They're not, they're not imprinted at birth with the idea, I'll do this. 
Uh, Janine in our audience asks, where do we need to put the biggest effort into conservation and are some states better than others at it? Uh, I want to circle back to the wolves. You mentioned Pluie the wolf. Um, wolves were not doing so hot in this country for several decades and now they're rebounding. Um, that and the states where they have those conservation efforts put in place are now seeing an increase in wolves. Um, but wh where do we need to put the biggest effort into conservation, Tony? Well, everywhere. Uh, uh, wolves have been, wolves want to be there. And it, it took an awful lot of effort to get rid of them. Uh, give them a chance, they'll come back. Now they're, they, we do, in certain places, I think we do have to learn some new rules. For instance, uh, grizzly bears. Uh, grizzly bears, wonderful wolf specialist I talked to said, you know, it's great to live out in the country where grizzly bears may roam, but you don't have to have beehives on your farm. You're really just telling grizzlies, come and get it. Uh, so there's certain things that we could do a little bit differently to make it seem like that we're not calling all, wolf, all wolves and calling all bears. It, it's a real, it's going to be a, a real process because ranchers are scared of wolves or, or scared of what wolves do to their flocks. Um, there are ways of making it much harder for animals to do what we don't want them to do. But again, it's not a, we're finally moving beyond that American progress painting of 1872. It's not all or nothing. We can think about more than one thing at a time. We don't have to think we gotta get rid of them uh, or else we'll never prosper. We can think about, well, uh, what could we do so that we prosper and they prosper at the same time? Uh, yeah, I was muted. Uh, so are there any states that are doing a better job of this? Oh, than others or well, that's good. I mean, we should be on a competitive basis. Uh, uh, as I said, New England as a whole, it's unusual that New England is trying to have a six state vision um, to protect that second chance, the forests that came back all the, by themselves. Uh, and, and there, these regional conservation partnerships uh, are a way of moving faster because an individual land trust can only take on so much, but if it amalgamates its interests with others um, in the same area, it has a chance to, to uh, have more of an impact. Um, and, and New Hampshire is so fascinating because so many different things are happening all at once. You've got wilderness, uh, possibilities pushing east uh, from the uh, White Mountains and south from the White Mountains, but you've got urban pressures pushing north from the Boston area. Um, so you're a real battleground, which is fascinating and not everyone likes to live in a battleground, but it's, it means it's a chance, you have a real chance to do something. Uh, it, it isn't something you can just take for granted, but it's something you can go out and take a part in. All right, so why don't we, uh, to our audience, if you have any questions that you would like us to ask before we wrap up, now is your chance to do so. And I have another question. What are some of the ways the average person can help? Um, what are some, some, I mean, we have this grand vision of we, there's this big conservation goal and it gets very intimidating to the average person to think, well, well what can I do? sitting here in my house in Concord, New Hampshire, what can I do to save the prairies and to save the forests? So what are some of the things that the average person can do? You touched on butterfly gardens. Um, so that's something that someone could re-landscape their front yard uh, so that it is more inviting to wildlife. What are some other things they could do? Do they write to their congressperson? Do they put, pitch their pennies into a pot? You know, all, all of the above, Elizabeth. Uh, as I said, if you just Google uh, local land trusts, you will find a wealth 
particularly in New Hampshire, because there are so many, such a network. Uh, in the South, you have efforts to save the Great Bay, uh, which have been very successful. You have uh, local land trusts in this Catequag near Manchester, which is saving 200 and 300 acre parcels that are still farms and forests within five miles of downtown Manchester. Um, it just got people working at every scale uh, every day. And it's possible both to be a volunteer, but it's also possible just to be someone who cheers them on. Um, and it's possible to uh, just get out there and see what's happening. Uh, in Concord, you know, getting down to the river is I think a wonderful opportunity. And you have, of course, then this great statewide land trust of the New Hampshire Forest uh, Society, which uh, has been around since 1901, uh, doing great things uh, and always hungry for more people to help. Uh, so you don't just have to write a check, you can do things personally, if, if you're so inclined. Uh, I see Janine is planting only pollinator plants this year, okay. The soil was tired last year, well, uh, it, we both, they need to make friends with us and we need to make friends with them for this to work. Um, but all it takes is an interest. All it takes is a kind of spark bird, something that pulls you in and keeps you roped in. Uh, and, and then it changes the, your feeling of where we are, not just locally, but as I said, in this, uh, the fact that the biosphere is incredibly robust, but at the same time, incredibly fragile. Don't forget that 12 and a half miles. That's the height within which every living thing uh, has to survive. I, I was calling it in the book, the within which. That is the, as close as I could get to a word for it. Uh, that's the constraint on, on every living creature. Uh, ancestral and descendant. And this is a, if, if it turns out that in order to save a million species from going extinct, we have to bump up the amount of, of conservation we do uh, at, to a tremendously high new rate, something like 12 times faster than we've ever done it in the past. Uh, what a challenge that is. Uh, and yet, uh, we're off to such a good start, you know. I think that uh, leads into this other question from Michael here. How is it possible to maintain optimism in the face of mass extinctions? I know that just being depressed about it certainly won't save any species. So what can we do to keep our spirits up about this? Well, one way is to see there are success stories like bald eagles, numbers of bald eagles have just quadrupled in the last few years because of efforts to keep them going. You know, it was back in the 1960s that Rachel Carson said that the shells of birds were disintegrating because of poisons in the, that we were spewing out into the world. Well, that's a big, big success story. And the eagle is rather important to us. Uh, Americans as our national bird. Uh, bison are making a big comeback. Um, so there are already success stories. But there's also just the other reason for optimism is so many people are already involved in, in doing so many different things uh, at, and, at, and at so many different scales. So uh, look around you. There are just dozens, hundreds, thousands of people involved in all of these different activities. Uh, and that's, that's what the book is sort of a chronicle of running into people, a woman down in Mexico who managed to bring water back to a, a bone dry branch, uh, people in the Sierras who are protecting land, trying to think ahead to the fact that uh, San Francisco is spreading east and north. Uh, but let's get ahead of the game and protect land before that enormous city 
region begins to impact us up here in the mountains. Um, in Massachusetts, uh, a brilliant scientist at the Nature Conservancy named Mark Anderson came up with a whole new way of assessing the health of land by saying, yes, we, we do know that some species are being pushed north as climate warms, but there are other places that seem to be able to hang on to their species. Why? Well, he figured that um, a place that has a certain amount of topological change, some hills and some valleys, all within a very small area, it's got wet places, it's got dry places, it's got cool places, it's got warm places. Species in, in those areas, just by moving around a little bit within their own landscape, can stay put. So he's given us the name Resilient Landscapes, and he and his team have now mapped the entire US with lapping over into Canada and down into Mexico for resilient landscapes. And it turns out that between a quarter and a third of the entire United States can be thought of as a resilient landscape. So that gives us a new goal for protecting those particular pieces of land. Um, that, that so much is happening that's so exciting in terms of getting ahead of the game that uh, optimism is, is just sort of the, um, well, what, the coin of the realm when you talk to these people. That's what I found. So, so, so much enthusiasm, so much high spirits among these groups uh, because they realize they're making a difference and that we collectively can make a difference. We don't have to uh, say farewell to all these wonderful species. Uh, Ed Wilson likes to say, every species is a masterpiece. We can't afford to lose any of these masterpieces that life has created. Well, that is a wonderful, uh, uplifting thought and to end our event on. Thank you very, very much, Tony Hiss, for joining us this evening. Uh, Rescuing the Planet is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We do have signed book plates to offer you with this book. And Tony, I believe you, you did offer to personalize book plates for us. So we would be very- uh, no, Elizabeth, let me just show you before we yeah. sign off that uh, map that's the end papers to the book, which I had specially commissioned for the book to show the great landscapes of the country, uh, of the continent. And then there are individual maps of each of those four landscapes within the book. Knopf is a, a wonderful publisher because they're one of the few groups that has never lost interest in and love for the art and craft of bookmaking. And they did an especially good job on this book. It's just an elegant, elegant product. Uh, the design is so crisp and it has this beautiful cover by Chip Kidd, one of the great jacket designers in the country showing a couple of elk out in Yellowstone. Uh, so I hope you'll want to look at the book and I hope you'll want to read it and get involved. Uh, and as Elizabeth just said, let her know and I will be delighted to inscribe a book plate to you uh, that you can slap into the book. And that's our social distance way of having an in-person book signing until we can all get back together again. I love it. That's a great idea. Thank you so much for joining us. Rescuing the Planet is available from Gibson's Bookstore. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you plant your pollinator gardens like Janine this summer, this spring. Get some compost going to clean up the soil. Have a great night, everybody. Bye, and thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth. Made this fun.